So given the insight so far, let's now go and design the most powerful graph neural network. So let's go and design the most expressive uh, graph neural network and let's develop the theory that will allow us uh, to do that. So the key observation so far is that the expressive power of a graph neural network can be characterized by the expressive power of the neighborhood aggregation function they use. Because the more expressive the neighborhood aggregation leads to a more expressive graph neural network. And we saw that if the neighborhood aggregation is injective, this leads to the most expressive uh, GNN. A neighborhood aggregation being injective, it means that whatever is the number and the features of the, of the children, you, you map every different combination into a different output, so no information get, gets lost. So let's do the following next. Let's theoretically analyze the expressive power of different uh, aggregation functions. So the way you think of neighborhood aggregation, uh, basically taking the information from the children and aggregating is, that neighborhood aggregation can be abstracted as a function over a multiset. A multiset is simply a set with uh, repeated elements, right? So if you say I'm a node here and I aggregated from two neighbors for two children, this is the same as saying I have a set of children, uh, two yellow guys, and I need to aggregate information from them, right? And of course, in a multiset, um, nodes can have different colors, nodes can have different features. So, you know, you could say, aha, uh -huh, I have a, I have two children, one with yellow attribute and the other one with blue attribute versus some other node has um, three children, two of them with yellow attribute or yellow feature and one uh, with the blue feature. And when we aggregate this information, we want the, the new message, the aggregated information not to be lost. Somehow we want to, uh, to, in this aggregation, in this compression step, basically to retain all the information we know about the children, right? So here we'd want to say two yellow and a blue, and here we want to say one yellow and one blue, so that these two multisets still remain uh, distinguishable as, as we are aggregating them uh, to their parent, so that then we aggregate this parent further to the super parent, uh, no information uh, gets lost. So let's look at uh, the neighborhood information uh, aggregation functions used by the two uh, models that we have discussed so far in the class. First, we'll talk about uh, GCN, which uses mean pooling. It uses element-wise mean pooling over neighborhood node features. And then let's talk about the max pooling variant of GraphSage that uses element-wise maximum pooling over neighboring uh, node features. And let's see what is the expressive power of mean and what is the expressive power of max uh, pooling. So uh, let's first talk about uh, GCN, so the mean pooling, when you average the messages coming from the, from the children. Uh, if we take the uh, element-wise mean, then in a GCN it's followed by a linear function and a ReLU uh, activation function. Um, and uh, what, is, uh, what is the observation? The observation function is that GCN's aggregation function cannot distinct, distinguish multi, different multisets with the same kind of proportion of colors, right? So for example, um, this is a failure case. When you average together messages, it doesn't, doesn't matter whether you average one yellow and one blue message or whether you average two yellow and two blue messages. At the end, the average is the same, right? And this is the failure case of the average. It, it will combine these two multisets, it will aggregate them into the, same, uh, into the same message. So it means it will lose information in the case that here are um, one and one, and here is two and two, because the ratio is the same. So let me be a bit more precise and give you a proper example. Let's for simplicity assume that node colors are represented as one hot encodings, right? So now every node, uh, every node uh, has a feature vector that simply encodes what color is the color of the node, right? That is its uh, feature vector. And this is just kind of a, a way to illustrate uh, this concept and what happens when we do uh, aggregation, right? So for example, when you do uh, average of uh, 
two vectors, uh, one, zero, and zero ones, you, you get uh, uh, half and half. So that's your aggregated message now of these two uh, feature vectors. Uh, in this case, when you have a multiset again of two yellow and two blue, here are the corresponding feature representations. If I take the, the, the element-wise average of these uh, four vectors, I also get half-half. So it means that even if I then apply some nonlinear transformation and activation and so on, at the end I will get the same output because the aggregation of uh, yellow and blue is the same as the aggregation of two yellows and two blues. Even though I encode them in uh, with different feature vectors, so yellow and blue nodes are de definitely distinguishable because you know one has the first element set to one and the other one has the second uh, element uh, set to one. So you see how mean pooling can basically aggregate uh, multisets that have the same proportion of uh, nodes of one type of feature versus the other type of feature um, into the same representation regardless of what is the total number of nodes or what is the total size of the underlying uh, multiset. So this is the issue with mean pooling. This is a failure case of mean pooling because it won't be able to distinguish a multiset of size 2 versus size 4 if the proportion of features is the same in both. Now let's look at uh, um, um, uh, graph sage uh, max pooling uh, variant of it. So we in the graph sage we apply a multilayer perceptron transformation and then take a, a element wise a maximum pooling. Um, and what we learn here is that maximum pooling function cannot distinguish different multisets with the same set of distinct colors, right? So what does, what does this mean is that all these different multisets will be aggregated into the same representation. Why is that the case? Is because as long as multisets have the same set of distinct colors, then the whatever is the maximum, right? Maximum will be one of the colors. That maximum is the same regardless of how many different nodes uh, and what are the proportions of colors in the, um, uh, in the multiset. So to give you an example, imagine I have these three different multisets, I, uh, I encode these colors using some encoding, then I apply some nonlinear transformation like an MLP to it because this is what GraphSage does, and let's assume without loss of generality that basically now, you know, these colors get transformed to some new colors and we encode these colors with one hot encodings, right? So everything is dis distinguishable at this level. But the problem is that now if you take uh, element-wise, meaning coordinate-wise maximum, in all these different cases, you get the same aggregation, you get the same maximum value, you get one and one. So this means that regardless whether the node has uh, two children, four children, or three children, um, and whatever is the ratio between blue and uh, uh, yellow, in all cases the maximum pooling will give me the same representation. So it means that all this information here gets lost and all these different multisets get mapped to the same representation. So clearly uh, maximum pooling is not an injective operator because it maps different inputs into the same uh, output. And that's the problem. We get these collisions and information uh, gets lost and that decreases the expressive power uh, of the graph neural network. So let's summarize what we have learned so far. We have analyzed the expressive power of graph neural networks and the main takeaways are the following. The expressive power of a graph neural network can be characterized by the expressive power of its neighborhood aggregation function, right? So the message aggregation function. Neighborhood aggregation is a function over multisets, basically sets with repeating elements. Um, and GCN and GraphSage aggregation functions fail to distinguish some of the basic multisets, meaning these two aggregation functions, mean and maximum, are not injective, which means different inputs get mapped into the same output and this way the information gets lost. Therefore, GCN and GraphSage are not maximally powerful graph neural networks. They're not maximally expressive 
uh, graph neural networks. So let's now move on and say, can we design the most expressive graph neural network, right? So our goal will be to design maximally powerful uh, graph neural network uh, among all possible message passing uh, graph neural networks. And this will, uh, the way we are going to do this is to, to design an injective neighborhood aggregation function. So basically a neighborhood aggregation function that will never lose information when it aggregates from the children to create a message uh, for the parent. So the property will be in injectivity of the aggregation function, right? Um, so the goal is to design a neural network that can model this injective uh, multiset function because that's the aggregation operator. So uh, here is a very uh, useful uh, theorem. Uh, the theorem says that any injective multiset function can be expressed in the following way. So it can be, so if I have a set of elements, right? I have my multiset function S, uh, multiset uh, that has a set of elements. Then the way I can write an injective function over a multiset is I can write it as a, I apply my function F to every element of the multiset. I sum up this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, outputs of F and then I apply another uh, nonlinear function. Okay, so the point is that if I want to have an in injective set over, um, over a multiset, then I can realize this injective uh, function by having two functions f and phi, where f I apply to every element of the multiset, I sum up the outputs of f, and then I apply another function, another transformation uh, phi to it. And uh, this means that uh, this is how um, a, um, a multiset function can be expressed uh, and it, it will still be uh, injective. So the way you can think of the proof, what is the intuition? The intuition is that our F can uh, produce kind of one hot encodings of colors, right? So F is injective, for different node it produces a different output um, and these outputs need to be different enough so that when you sum them up, you don't lose any information. So in some sense, if, if F takes colors and produces their one hot encodings, this means that then you can basically by summing up, you are counting how many elements of each color you have. And this way you don't lose any information, right? You say, aha, uh -huh, I have one yellow node and I have uh, two blue nodes. And that is kind of the way you can think of F, right? F takes the colors and, and kind of encodes them as one hot so that when you sum them up, you basically count how many different colors you have. Of course, f needs to be a function that does, that does this. If f does not do this for you, um, this, won't, uh, this won't work. So f has to be a very special uh, function um, and then uh, it will uh, work out. So now the question is, what kind of function f and phi can I use? How do I define them? And we are going to, to use them to basically define them with a neural network. We are going to define them using a multi-layer perceptron. Um, and why would we want to define it just using a perceptron? The reason is that uh, there is something called a universal approximation theorem. And it goes as follows. So uh, a one a hidden layer uh, multiple uh, layer perceptron with sufficiently large uh, hidden layer dimensionality and appropriate nonlinearity uh, can approximate any continuous function to an arbitrary accuracy, right? So what is this saying? It says that I have this unknown special functions uh, phi and f that I need to define so that, I, so that I can write my injective function in terms of f and phi, but f and phi are not known ahead of time. So but, so I'm going to represent f and phi with neural networks. And then because multilayer perceptron is able to learn any function to arbitrary accuracy, this basically means I can use data to learn f and phi that have the property to, to, to create these types of injective mappings. So basically this means that um, we have a right to a neural network that can model any injective function. 
right? If I take a multiset with elements uh, x, then if I apply a multilayer perceptron to it, sum it up and apply another multilayer perceptron, then multilayer perceptron can um, approximate any function, so it can approximate my function f and phi as well. So this means now I have a neural network that can do this injective multiset uh, mapping. And, you know, in theory, this embedding dimensionality, the dimensionality of the MLP could be very large, but in practice it turns out that, you know, something between 100 and 500 um, is good enough and gives you a uh, good performance. So what magic has just happened is that we said any injective multiset function can be written as a, um, as a, uh, uh, as a, with two functions f and phi, f is first applied to every uh, element of the multiset, summed up, and that, that is passed through the function phi, and this way uh, the, uh, the injectivity uh, is preserved. And because of the universal approximation theorem, we can model f and phi with a multilayer perceptron, and now uh, we have an injective uh, aggregation function, because MLP can learn any possible function, and, uh, um, and uh, the other MLP also can learn any function, meaning it can learn the function uh, f as well. So um, what is now the most expressive graph neural network there is? The most expressive graph neural network there is is called graph isomorphism neural network, or uh, GIN for short. And the way its aggregation function looks like, it says, let's take messages from the children, let's transform them with a multilayer perceptron, let's sum them up and apply another uh, multilayer uh, perceptron. And, you know, uh, given everything I explained, this is a injective multiset aggregation function, so it means it has no failure cases, it doesn't have any collisions, and this is the most expressive graph neural network in the class of these message passing uh, graph neural networks. So, um, it is super cool that we were basically able to uh, define the most powerful graph neural network um, uh, out of uh, an entire class uh, of graph neural networks. And we now theoretically understand that it is really all about the aggregation function and that the summation aggregation function is better than the average, is better than the maximum. So um, let me uh, summarize a bit. Right? We have described neighborhood aggregation uh, 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 function of uh, gene, um, and uh, we see that basically the aggregation is a summation. We take messages, we transform them through an MLP, and then sum them up, and that has the injective property, which means it will be able to capture the structure of the entire computation graph. Now uh, that we have seen what gene uh, is, we are going to describe uh, the full uh, model of the graph isomorphism network, and we are actually going to relate it back to the uh, weissfeiler lehmann graph kernel, the WL graph kernel that we talked about, I think, in lecture number two. And what we are going to provide is this very interesting perspective where we are going to see that uh, gene is a neural network version of the WL kernel. So um, let me explain this in more detail. So what is WL graph kernel, right? It is also called a color refinement algorithm, where basically we are given a graph G and a set of nodes V. We assign initial color uh, uh, C to each node V. Um, let's say we, the colors are based on the degree of the node. And then we are uh, iteratively aggregating hashing colors of neighbors to create a new color for the node, right? So we take the, at, at, uh, if we want to create the color at level k plus 1 for a given node, we take the colors of the nodes uh, u that are its neighbors from the previous iteration, we take uh, color of node v from the previous iteration, somehow hash this together into a new color, right? And hash, hash function, the idea is that it maps different inputs to different uh, outputs. Uh, so hash functions are as injective uh, as possible. And the idea is that after k steps of this color refinement, the color uh, of every node will summarize the k-hop neighborhood structure uh, around a given node. So let me give you an example. Imagine I have two different graphs. Um, opa, uh, here they are. 
uh, they are different, they are um, uh, uh, non-isomorphic. So the way we do this is, uh, let's say we first simply initialize all the colors to value 1, and then we aggregate, right? So the, for example, this node has color 1, and then has three neighbors, each one of color 1, so this will be now 1, 1, 1, 1, and then, you know, every node does the same. Now we are going to hash uh, uh, these uh, descriptions, these uh, colors, into new colors. And let's assume that our hash function is injective, meaning it has no uh, collisions, then this would be a new set of uh, node colors now. Um, and for example, in this case, this node uh, and that node have the same color because their descriptions uh, are the same, right? They have color 1 and they have three neighbors each with color 1. So uh, this particular input got mapped to a new color uh, number 4. And now I can repeat this process uh, uh, one more time and so on. What you should notice is that at every iteration of this WL kernel, what is happening is we are taking the colors uh, from the neighbors uh, and putting them together, together with our own color. So if you go back and look here, this is very similar to the uh, graph neural network, where we take messages from the neighbors, combine it with the V's own message, somehow transform uh, all this into a new, and, and uh, transform this and call this that this is the message for node V at the next level. So this is essentially like a hard-coded graph neural network, right? We take uh, colors from neighbors, uh, aggregate them, take our own color, aggregate it, and then call this to be the embedding of the node V at the next uh, layer or at the next uh, level. So the point is that as the more iterations we do this, the farther out information uh, is captured at a given node, right? The farther out kind of the network neighborhood gets, more and more hops get added to it. Um, and the idea with this color refinement is that the, um, if you are doing, let's say, um, isomorphism testing, then um, the process continues until the stable coloring is reached, and two graphs are considered isomorphic if they have the same set of colors. In our case, the colors in these two graphs are different, the distribution of them, the number of them, is different, which means these two graphs are not isomorphic. And you, if you look at them, you really see that uh, they are not uh, isomorphic. So now, how does this relate to the gene model, right? Gene uses neural network to model this injective hash function, right? The way we can uh, write out gene is we can say, aha, it's some aggregation over the, the uh, embeddings messages from the children, uh, from the neighbors of node uh, V, plus the color, the message of the node V uh, from the previous uh, step. So the way we write this in terms of um, uh, uh, gene operator is to say, aha, we are taking the messages uh, from the children, we, uh, we transform them using an MLP, this is our function f, and we sum them up. Um, and then we uh, also add 1 plus epsilon, where epsilon is some small uh, learnable scalar, um, our own message transformed by f, and then add the two together and pass through another function uh, phi. And this is exactly now a, um, uh, an injective operator that basically an in an injective way maps the neighborhood information plus the, um, plus, plus the node's own information into a unique embedding, into a unique uh, representation. So, um, if assume that in input uh, features C is represented, let's say, as one hot uh, encoding, then basically just direct summation is injective, right? So if I say, how do I uh, have an injective function over a multiset where elements of a multiset are encoded with one hot, then basically all I um, have to do is sum up these vectors and I'll get a unique representation because every coordinate will count how many nodes of a given color uh, there are. Now, if these colors are not presented so nicely, you need to transform them with the function f so that it kind of approximates this uh, intuitive one-hot encoding, right? So this means that uh, a uh, gene uh, uh, aggregation, gene uh, type of uh, convolution is composed of 
two, M uh, uh, two MLPs, one uh, operated on the colors of neighbors, one, um, and then the aggregation is a summation, uh, plus some uh, final MLP that again kind of provides the next level one hot encoding so that when we again sum up information from the children at the next level, no information uh, gets lost. So you can think of this Fs and uh, Fs and phi as some kind of transforma transfor transformations that kind of softly do uh, one hot uh, encoding. So let's now uh, summarize and provide the entire uh, gene model. Uh, gene uh, node embedding update goes as follows, right? Given a graph with a set of nodes V, we assign a scalar uh, vector to each node V, and then iteratively op, uh, apply this uh, gene conv uh, operator that basically takes the information from the neighbors, takes its own information, applies these fu uh, functions f and phi that are modeled by MLPs, and produces the next level embedding. And if you look at this, this is now written exactly the same way as the WL, right? Rather than hash here, we write out this gene conv. So this means that basically after k steps of gene iteration, C to CK summarizes the, the structure of the k-hop neighborhood around a given node uh, V. So to bring the two together, this means that gene can be understood as a differentiable neural network version of WL uh, graph kernel, right? Where in WL we use node colors um, and uh, let's say we can encode them as one hot and we use this uh, abstract deterministic hash function while in gene we use node embeddings, which are low dimensional vectors, and we use this gene convolution with these two MLPs, the MLP phi and the MLP uh, f, that uh, aggregate uh, information. You know, what are the advantages of gene over the WL? Is that no em node embeddings are low dimensional, uh, hence they can capture uh, the fine grained similarity of different nodes and that parameters uh, of the update function can be learned from the downstream task. So we are going to actually be able to learn functions f uh, and phi that uh, ensure uh, injectivity. So, um, you know, because the relationship between gene and WL kernel, their exactly ex expressive power is exactly the same. So this now means that if two graphs can be distinguished by gene, they can be also distinguished by WL and vice versa. So it means that uh, graph neural networks are at most as powerful or as expressive as the WL uh, kernel or WL graph isomorphism test. Um, and uh, this is great because now we have the upper bound. We know that gene attains this upper bound and we also know that WL kernel both theoretically and empirically has shown to distinguish many or most of the real world graphs, right? So this means that gene is the powerful enough to distinguish most uh, real world uh, graphs, which is, uh, great, uh, which is great news. So let me summarize. Uh, we design a neural network that can model injective multiset function by basically saying that any injective multiset function can be written as a, uh, a application of a function f to the elements of the multiset plus a summation. Um, in our case, we use a neural network for neighborhood aggregation function uh, and rely on the um, universal approximation theorem to basically say that MLP is able to learn any function. So this means that gene is able to capture the neighborhoods in an injective way which means it is the most powerful or most expressive graph neural network there is. Um, and the key is to use element-wise summation pooling instead of min or max pooling. So it means that some pooling is more expressive than min or max pooling. We also saw that the gene is closely related to the WL kernel and that both gene and WL kernel can distinguish uh, most of the real world uh, graph structures. To summarize the, the, the important point of the lecture is that if you say about mean and max pooling, for example, mean and max pooling are not able to distinguish these types of neighborhood structures where you have two or three neighbors, all the same features. Here is where maximum pooling fails because 
the number of distinct kind of the distinct colors are the same so whatever is the maximum is the same in both cases and this is again the case where both min and max pooling fail because we have uh, um, green and red and they are in the same proportion so if you rank uh, different pooling operators by di by discriminative power um, some pooling is the best is most expressive is more expressive than mean pooling is more expressive than uh, maximum pooling so in general some pooling uh, is the most expressive uh, to use in graph neural networks and last thing i want to mention is that you can further improve the expressive power of graph neural networks so the important characteristic of what we talked today was that node features are indistinguishable meaning that all nodes have the same node feature information so by adding rich features nodes may become um, distinguishable the other important thing that we talked about today is that because graph neural networks only aggregate features and they use no reference point in, in the network nodes that have the same um, uh, computation graph structure will be, are indistinguishable and what we are going to talk about uh, later in the course is actually how do we improve the expressive power of uh, graph neural networks um, to be more expressive than gene and to be more expressive that, than uh, WL and of course in those cases it will actually require more than just message passing it will require more advanced operations um, and we are going to talk about those um, in the future